Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you uh, to our today's speaker, Professor uh, James Moore. So uh, James is a Royal Academy of Engineering Chair in uh, Medical Device Design at Imperial College London and the Director of Research for the Department of Bioengineering. Uh, he is also a Fellow of Institution of Mechanical Engineers, American Society of Mechanical Engineers and American Institute for Mechanical and Biological Engineering. Um, so James has done a lot of fantastic research in biomechanics, uh, particularly uh, on the lymphatic system and also on cardiovascular biomechanics, stents, implantable devices and uh, atherosclerosis. Uh, he is also a great bass player. Uh, so today, today James will tell us about uh, lymphatic system transport and vaccine design. And uh, without further ado, uh, yeah, the, James, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Masha, and, and thanks to you and Steve for organizing this. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be invited to give a talk in this series of great seminars. And uh, I look forward to watching more of them myself. So um, I'm going to tell you a bit about the lymphatic system today. So I, uh, because not many people work on the lymphatics, I thought I would give a, a basic explanation of what the system does. So essentially, your, your uh, blood circulatory system carries blood around the body. And of course, the real job of the, of the blood system is to deliver nutrients uh, here down at the level of the capillaries. And uh, as part of doing that job, there's a net leakage of fluid out at the capillary level into the interstitium. So there's some spaces between the tissues and between the cells of your body. And that fluid uh, has to be gathered up and returned to the blood system. Otherwise, you end up with swollen tissues and all sorts of other problems. So that return of that extra fluid in the interstitium is the job of the lymphatic system. Now, a lot of your interstitial spaces are at zero or even sub-atmospheric pressure. So there's no pressure to drive this flow. So each of these uh, little in individual lymphatic vessels here serves as its own pump. And I'll show you an example of that in the next slide. Um, some basic numbers on the system. So compared to blood flow, this is a very low pressure and low flow system. So the, the heart pumps about five liters per minute. The whole lymphatic system pumps about five liters per day. I mentioned the sub-atmospheric pressures uh, in some of the interstitial tissue spaces and indeed within some of the lymphatic vessels. Um, so it, uh, maintaining positive transmural pressure is obviously very uh, important in terms of you know, maintaining vessel patency as well as uh, keeping the pumping going. It's a, it's a small system. So the, the largest diameter vessel in the body is the thoracic duct and it's about two or three millimeters in diameter in the adult human. Um, so with all this added together, then the Reynolds numbers end up being, uh, you know, kind of in the single digits range, uh, which is, uh, may sound boring to some fluid mechanicists, but uh, I think it's still very interesting fluid flow. And I hope to make that case for you as the day goes on here. Um, the flow is on study, but it's, but it is still viscous. Uh, so if you look at the, for example, the Wormersley parameter, which is the dimensionless parameter representing uh, unsteady effects to viscous effects, is quite small. So, uh, so this is all still quite viscous flow, but, but still a lot of fun to look at. So um, I mentioned that the, um, uh, that the lymphatic system does its own pumping. So these, these little vessels here that connect the interstitium, sort of these initial lymphatics, which are quite small and don't actively pump, um, they, they, but the pumping vessels connect that to, to the lymph nodes. Um, and because the interstitial fluid here can contain dirt, debris, cancer cells, other things that might harm you, uh, this fluid needs to be cleaned by the time it goes back into the blood system. And that's the job of the lymph node. So these, these vessels that do the pumping the way they do this is a combination of squeezing and check valves, right? So this is a uh, rat mesenteric lymphatic vessel. It's about 100 microns in diameter. And you can see on the right, there's a spinning confocal image of a lymphatic valve. So they're bileaflet valves, similar to vein valves, uh, but, they're, but they're quite small and very closely spaced. So it's about 10 diameters from valve to valve uh, in a lymphatic vessel. So in the, in the movie on the left, there's a valve just upstream of that movie and there's a valve just downstream. So we can track the walls of these vessels. Uh, we can also track the, uh, the progression of these cells through the vessel and get an idea of the velocity. So these, felt, these cells are moving at uh, sort of one to 10 millimeters per second. 
And, uh, and the flow rate uh, is about 200 microliters per hour. So just so consider that microliters per hour is, is, is the amount, amount of flow that you go through, get through a, a individual lymphatic vessel. Um, so these cells that, that you can see going through the vessel here are a combination of lymphocytes and dendritic cells. So these are important cells for immune functions. Uh, um, they're so fall into the class of white blood cells that flow around in the blood. Um, they make their way out into the periphery to do their job for the immune system. And then at some point they need to be transported into the lymph node. And, and, and that, so that's the action that you see happening here. So you can see the flow is very dynamic. It speeds up, it slows down. And that depends on the contractile behavior, not only of this uh, segment of the lymphatic muscle, but also the segment in, in the upstream and, and downstream. So uh, lots of interesting pumping mechanics here. And we've spent a fair amount of time uh, modeling that, but I'm not gonna be talking very much about that today. I'm gonna try and, talk and focus on what goes on in, in terms of information delivery and, uh, and within the lymph nodes um, mainly. So uh, in, in terms of the delivery from the periphery into the lymph node, what we find, and, and this is numerous experiments in, in uh, rats, mice, humans, guinea pigs, um, that, that when you have some antigen delivery into periphery, it goes into the lymphatic system and it'll show up in the nearest lymph node within minutes, really. Um, and and that, so that uh, sort of suggests that this transport um, provided by lymphatic pumping is, is important. And often what I, what I get when I talk about this system with, the, uh, with biologists or immunologists, they say, well, you know, cells can migrate as well. So what about cell motility? Well, uh, antigen presenting cells, which can gather uh, information uh, and, and in the periphery and then flow through those lymphatic vessels as I showed you in the last slide, can migrate. And when they do, they crawl at a speed of about five nanometers per minute. So that's uh, at that speed, it would take about four years to traverse a distance of one centimeter. That velocity is about eight orders of magnitude smaller than the velocity of the cell I showed you in the pumping lymphatic vessel. That was about one centimeter per second. So eight orders of magnitude in velocity. Um, to illustrate that, I'll show you a picture of my lab group. So this is a, a hike that we do um, every year on the south coast of England. And uh, so walking speed, uh, if you compare walking speed uh, and, and you make that analogous to the crawling uh, antigen presenting cell, uh, then the one centimeter per second I showed you in the pumping lymphatic vessel previously uh, is about eight orders of magnitude faster. So that's about the same ratio as walking speed to the speed of light. So if you need to transport something from the periphery into a lymph node, fluid flow is the way to go. So uh, what happens then within lymph nodes? Well, the lymph nodes are interesting structures. So I'm gonna spend a bit of a time telling you a little bit about them. So you can see these afferent vessels here where, where the flow comes in. You can see them splitting into multiple parallel lymphatic vessels as they approach the lymph node. Um, and again, you know, keep in mind this is that all of the pumping happens by these tiny little uh, individually pumping lymphatic vessels. They cannot generate very much pressure. So to drive the flow through this relatively uh, uh, high resistance lymph node, it helps to split into multiple parallel vessels, which is an interesting design feature. Uh, once that information comes into the lymph node, it gets distributed to uh, lymphocytes and other immune cells scattered throughout the lymph node. Um, lymph nodes are about one to two centimeters in humans, so they need their own blood vessel supply. These are unique blood vessels that you don't see in other parts of the body, very interesting blood vessels to study. And then uh, the lymph will eventually continue on in the efferent lymphatic vessel here. Now there are some in interesting uh, aspects to this. So, so why do we have lymph nodes? Well, they are essentially a collection uh, in, of lymphatic, of, of immune cells in very, very high density. So if you, if you look at the ratio of lymphocyte density in the lymph node compared to lymphocyte density in the muscle or other peripheral tissues, um, it's actually very high and it's, and it's several orders of magnitude. So here's another analogy for you to uh, give you some idea of the rate, that ratio of density. Um, the, the, it's about the same as the ratio of the population density of uh, middle Manhattan 
uh, compared to the population density in, in, uh, in the UK. So what needs to happen actually in these lymph nodes is information needs to get passed from cell to cell. So it's sort of like trying to pass information by asking one person to whisper something to the next person. And obviously, if you have a very high density of cells in there, then that helps that communication process. Um, so here's another view of a lymph node. It's got a bit more of the internal structure in it. So it's nice for illustrating, uh, for example, the, the B cell uh, follicles here uh, in these sort of golf ball looking structures. And the T lymphocytes are, are located in this paracortex or this middle densely packed region here. Now, um, you can see how it sort of all that information gets collected, all that fluid that, that has come in, uh, get, then ends up flowing out here. Um, as the fluid flows in, it gets distributed around the periphery of the lymph node in a structure known as the subcapsular sinus, or SS, in this figure here. So it's kind of like a parallel plate region with these buttresses in the middle of it. So that gives the fluid a chance to, to flow around the periphery before it dives into the relatively dense um, parenchyma, which is more like a porous medium here. So you can see uh, the, these tightly packed regions of cells here. This is a blood vessel uh, and H means high endothelial venule, which is a, the, the unique structure of, of the cells, uh, of, of the blood vessels inside the lymph node. So there's, there's lots of interesting um, exchange of fluid and information going on here between the lymph passageways uh, through the porous medium and the blood vessels, which are actually proper blood vessels uh, with arteries and veins, uh, not just the high endothelial venules. So we've done some imaging of, uh, of uh, blood vessels inside of mouse lymph nodes. So mouse lymph nodes are about one millimeter in diameter. So this whole image is about one millimeter side to side here. And uh, so these Im this is done with micro CT imaging and the, the vessels are encoded uh, by color with their diameter. So one of these big red vessels is a vein. Uh, the other big red vessel is an artery. And, uh, and, the, and the blue ones are, are mainly capillaries. So you can see um, it's quite a complex three-dimensional structure. So I think it's the proper way to think about a lymph node is it's it's almost like a heat exchanger, but it's it's a it's a fluid exchanger and a and a mass transport uh, organ and also an information exchange organ. So you've got these blood vessels, uh, you know, with blood coursing through them, and in, interspersed within that is this densely packed porous medium of lymph flowing through it with immune information in it. Uh, there's an important exchange of cells uh, across the blood vessel walls. So about 90% of all the lymphocytes that are in your lymph nodes got there through these blood vessel walls. Um, so, so there's really important information exchange, cell exchange, fluid exchange between the blood passageways and the lymph passageways. So we got interested in uh, how much fluid moves across these uh, vessel walls and uh, constructed a computational model of fluid flow, uh, both the lymph flow and the blood flow uh, but in, inside a lymph node, and you can see sort of the flow chart here, if you like, of uh, showing how the flow comes in through the afferent vessels, goes into the subcapsular sinus, which uh, I'll remind you is this sort of uh, parallel plate, fairly open fluid region here. So it's fluid flow region. So the fluid flow can actually move around the periphery. And what we think happens is that um, it moves, some of it at least moves into the medullary sinus, this sort of lymph collection area um, before it goes out the efferent vessels. So some of it can go directly from one to the other, and some of it will seep through the middle of the lymph node through those B cell follicles and the T cell cortex. And, uh, and then of course, within all of that, uh, including the B cell follicles, there are these blood vessels where fluid can move in and out. So you can't measure fluid flow in, uh, in these structures. So, uh, so we did our best to sort of estimate the system parameters. And um, what we found is that most of the fluid flow, and this is under normal conditions, moves around the periphery of the lymph node. So about 90% of the flow is gonna follow this path of least resistance through the subcapsular sinus and down into the medullary sinus and then out the efferent vessel. Only about 10% of the flow under normal conditions is actually gonna seep into the middle of the node, that densely packed porous medium region where the lymphocytes are located. And you might think, well, why is that? Well, remember this is under normal conditions when you're not responding 
to any antigen. There's no, you know, so no vaccination, no, you know, nothing like that for your lymph nodes to respond to. And what I'll show you later on is that these flows actually get shifted pretty strongly when you have some uh, something for your immune system to react to. So uh, we got interested then in, in what is going on in, in the multi-scale sense. So, uh, you know, this is obviously uh, a model of a, of a centimeter or two uh, diameter structure here. And, and of course, the, a lot of the important action is gonna be happening down at the cell level. So uh, we, we uh, started working with some immunologists at Harvard and uh, this is Mike from Mike Carroll's lab, the, the, the image that got us really interested in, in looking at these structures in more detail. And so um, if you, uh, relative to the lymph node model I showed you earlier, uh, we've got the subcapsular sinus here in green, kind of turned 90 degrees to what I showed you previously. So this is the subcapsular sinus on the right-hand side of the movie here. And what's happening here is we've got two different antigens coming in. The small one is labeled as red. The large antigen is labeled in green. And you can see they get transported through the lymph node in very, very different ways. And the object, of course, is to get that antigen information in here, in this case, to the B cells so that they can react to it. So these, these blue B cells have been trained to recognize this antigen. Um, the white B cells have not been trained to re recognize the antigen, but you can see as soon as the uh, red antigen flows in, the, 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 belt, the B cells light up and, and then they start to exchange its information so you can, with the other cells. So you can see these cells migrating around. And so these would be like a busy sidewalk in Manhattan and people telling each other uh, about this thing that might come in and attack the city. So, um, so we, we got interested in why it appears that these that, that this small antigen is transported down these tiny little pipes here. Well, it turns out people had seen these structures before, but didn't really know what they were about. So, uh, so they're called conduits. And the conduit system just sort of anecdotally has been viewed as this way of connecting the subscapsular sinus to the high endothelial venules. And they do sort of run towards the center of the lymph node, um, and they carry again. They, they carry these small antigens, not the larger ones, um, and they're and they're in, in, uh, surrounded by specialized cells, uh, fibroreticular cells that are something like fibroblasts, but they can also contract and relax like smooth muscle. Um, so, so you know, what is the reason that uh, these things exist? Why are they transporting only small? Uh, antigens and uh, and what does that have to do with adaptive immunity? Well, these are things that we're trying to uncover, at least from the fluid mechanics point of view. So that's I'm not going to tell you much more about immunology today. I'm going to be sort of trying to focus on more how the the information gets delivered with the with the interesting fluid mechanics. So we did some imaging uh, with Alex Porter in our materials department here of the conduit. So the conduit in this case is this little structure in the middle surrounded by these cells here. So we segment out the conduit and, uh, and then uh, get this in full 3D. And you can see it is kind of like a little tube, but if you noticed earlier, it's got these little collagen fibers running through it. So this thing is, is maybe uh, about a micron across in diameter uh, compared to the cells, which would be tens of microns across. So it's a tiny little structure. You can see the little co the collagen fibers at about this point in the movie. Um, so if you look at one of these things in cross section, this is what it looks like. So it's like if you were holding a bundle of pencils in your hand, that's what the collagen conduits are. So the, the collagen fibers are inside the conduit. And so the fluid flow, uh, as it, if it's happening through the conduit, is happening in the space kind of in between the collagen fibers. Um, and with the collagen fibers, we think they're to sort of direct the movement of the antigen down into the parenchyma of the lymph node and to the immune cells located within the lymph node. Um, so we can segment out the wall of that, we can segment out the fibers, and then try and construct sort of an idealized model of that so that we can um, study the the, the uh, the transport of the antigen down the conduits. So we can change the sort of slightly awkward shape of the, of the conduit into a circular shape, doesn't make any difference to the fluid mechanics. But what we do vary is the, uh, is the fiber density because they, they do come in quite different densities if you look at different conduits. And so we spent some time trying to get the, these models done correctly. 
And then what we did was we constructed them up into a, uh, a model of a, of a lymph node on, you know, so this is a multi-scale model where we've got the scale of the lymph node here um, about, uh, about a millimeter across representing that mouse lymph node. And, uh, and each one of these would be, uh, these little lines here would be a conduit with those collagen fibers um, located within them. And uh, the, 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 the conduit network then is based on uh, some, some brilliant work from uh, uh, other researchers in this area that have that have basically shown how these things are connected to each other in very interesting ways. Uh, and then we just run a sort of 1D fluid solver through that. And I've highlighted here that uh, when we move fluid down the conduit, we assume that everything else is impermeable. So whatever fluid is moving through the conduit doesn't uh, go out into the surrounding parenchyma. And, and I'll come back to the importance of that later on. Um, and then we can also, once we have the fluid flow through there, we can uh, then solve the uh, infectious diffusion equations with the, uh, with the diffusivity representative of that 15 uh, kilodalton antigen that was coming in through the conduit that I showed you earlier. And uh, when we do that, then we get something not surprising that that looks like that uh, experimental movie from Mike Carroll's lab I showed you earlier. And um, and with about the same amount of time required for the information to move through the lymph node. And uh, so, so that's great. So we can reproduce that. And then we thought, all right, well, what happens if we turn the flow off? And it turns out it changes nothing. So uh, if, you, if you calculate the Peclet number in your head uh, based on the velocities and, and the size of that engine that I showed you earlier, um, you, know, you, you get something on, on the order of, uh, unity, although there's a lot of variation because the velocity actually varies a lot through these uh, through these vessels, and the size of the antigen can vary a, a lot, which affects the diffusivity. So it, it wasn't immediately obvious uh, that that um, that this was going to be a purely diffusive phenomenon, but but that seems to be the case. So when we turn the, the the flow on and off, it really doesn't matter that much, and and we've given the flow the best chance to make a difference here because we've used a a conduit with a very, very low fiber density. So this is about as high as the velocity would ever get in any reasonable conduit. So then uh, we turned our uh, attention towards the diffusion. And uh, so this is a, a, you can see it's sort of medium density collagen fiber uh, uh, conduit. And you can, uh, so what we're doing is we're pulsing in an antigen from the outside here. It turns the whole thing yellow. Uh, we let that get to steady state, and then we and then we pulse out in some sense the um, the, the 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 antigen by applying you know boundary conditions at the, of of concentration at the outer boundary, and so that's how it moves in and out. Um, and then what we can do is uh, then um, do that for several different fiber densities. So all of these movies are. Uh, are seem to be kind of doing the same thing, but I'll point out that we scaled the time here. Um, and this one is running at 244 times higher speed uh, than this movie over here. So if you look at how the concentration uh, on average is, is changing in these conduits, you can see with the, with the low fiber density, it comes up in say, uh, you know, on the order of milliseconds, whereas uh, with the high fiber density, conduit, it, it's uh, orders of magnitude slower. So, um, and so what's happening here, we think is, is, is a version of subdiffusion. So in the radial direction. So if you think about this case, case one being, um, you know, probably really close to what would be happening in the axial direction. So the, the, the material would be moving, would be moving down the axial direction with roughly the same time scale as, uh, as this case one here. But then any radial diffusion out of the conduit would be happening at a much lower uh, time scale. So what we think is happening in, the, in that original Mike Carroll movie and in our simulations is that uh, it's, it's really a, a, an anisotropic diffusion problem in which the, um, in which the uh, antigen is moving much faster in the axial direction down the conduit than it would be allowed to diffuse out radially. And again, that's as, as you might imagine, due to the sort of tortuous pathway that uh, the antigen would, antigen would have to traverse to get out through these tightly packed collagen fibers here. So what I've shown you so far 
uh, is that the lymphatic system is transporting information to the lymph nodes for your immune system. It's very important for several, uh, uh, to, to, for several normal uh, physiologic functions as well as uh, several diseases. So uh, I mentioned earlier, cancer cells can be transported by the lymphatic system into your lymph nodes. And uh, that's a very important thing for, for cancer patients because uh, if those cancer cells make it past your immune system, past your lymph nodes, they get transported to other parts of the body and set up secondary tumors. And those cause about 90% of all cancer deaths. So there are lots of important reasons why we want to study uh, this transport process through, through lymph nodes. Um, those pumping vessels fight an overall uh, adverse pressure difference. Um, with active pumping. So, you know, the, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, periphery can be at um, sub-atmospheric pressures and you're returning this uh, mostly uphill because we're vertical beings and returning it into the venous system, which is at a pressure of about 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury. So uh, there's a, it's a fairly substantial adverse pressure difference that's overcome with that active pumping. That information is delivered from the periphery into the nearest lymph node within minutes uh, due to the fantastic nature of the, the active pumping of those lymphatic vessels. And lymph nodes uh, have both lymph, lymph flow and blood flow, and they interact in, in very interesting and, and wonderful ways. Uh, and then these conduits are transporting the small antigens using anisotropic diffusion or a version of, of radial subdiffusion. Now, um, what does all this have to do with vaccination, which was in the title of the talk here today? So um, I'll just give you kind of an overall cartoon of, of what we think um, uh, of, of representation of, of vaccination. So you've got the syringe here, you've got uh, some information on the disease that, that might harm you, the antigen here. And then you might uh, also have a substance called an adjuvant in here. I'll come back to that in a moment. That's getting injected into your muscle. There are relatively few lymphatic vessels in the muscle compared to other places that we might inject a vaccine, uh, namely sub subcutaneous spaces or intradermal spaces. But that's where we've been injecting vaccines for, for about 100 years now. And, uh, and uh, so that information gets taken up by the lymphatic system. It needs to make it to your lymph node so that these cells can communicate to each other the information on that antigen. And then you can develop the antibodies and you can develop the, the, the T cell immunity and then uh, fight it next time it comes in. So then, you know, once that information is passed within the lymph node to enough cells, those cells go out either through the efferent lymphatic vessel, or in some cases directly into the blood vessels to get distributed around the body. So, uh, so you can see this is uh, a, an information delivery process, really. Uh, this is gathered up in the periphery, it's pumped actively to the lymph node, and then the lymph node as an information exchange organ passes that information on. So getting back to this adjuvant, so the, these adjuvants are intended to kick up your immune response and help your body recognize the antigen better. So where do adjuvants come from? Well, um, the history of adjuvants, uh, uh, sorry, and our research goal is to, un is, it, it is in this case is to understand the adjuvants and how they modulate the information delivery process. So the history of adjuvants actually goes back about a hundred years to uh, a researcher who was in the South of London, Alexander Glenny, um, and he, quite by accident noticed that guinea pigs developed better immunity uh, in response to a vaccination if they had some sign of inflammation around the injection site. So he, uh, I, I'm not sure that there's, uh, uh, that this is true, but I've heard this sort of legendary story. Uh, and so uh, why let truth get in the way of a good story? So he, he, he looked up on his, uh, on his shelf to his uh, chemicals that he could apply to um, induce inflammation around the injection site and uh, it was arranged alphabetically and so he chose alum, aluminum salt, and uh, mixed it in with the vaccine and found that that reliably produced inflammation and since then uh, we've all been subjected to vaccines with alum in them. It's in uh, many millions of vaccinations been used already and it continues to be the most common adjuvant used in vaccines. Um, and so the real question that we ought to be asking is how does it work? 
So Glenny himself proposed the depot theory, having seen that there were signs of inflammation around the injection site, thought, well, the, you know, these, these adjuvants are, are kicking off the reaction of those local immune cells ar around the injection site to take up the antigen. And then that's how they work. Well, uh, turns out there's not much experimental support for this depot theory, but people still believe it. Um, and, and in the in intervening 100 years, people have gone on to develop other types of adjuvants. So oil and water emulsions, TLR activators. So TLR stands for toll-like receptor. So these are uh, receptors on immune cells that um, very strongly, uh, once they are activated, very strongly um, kick up your immune reaction. Um, and so, so knows that people know that they help with vaccines, and they they, they still use uh, adjuvants in vaccines today. Um, but they don't really know how they uh, work, and and so that brings up the question: How do you pick a particular adjuvant to go with a vaccine? Once you develop some antigen, how do you choose which of these three different types of adjuvants? Um, uh, to, to go along with your vaccine. And, and it's all just completely empirical. They just try these things randomly. If they work great, if they don't, they try something else. So what we're after is, is kind of looking at how adjuvants influence the immune uh, information delivery process so that there's a more rational basis for choosing which adjuvant goes with a particular vaccine. So I'll remind you of the pumping story here. So this is uh, one of those lymphatic vessels. I can see that there's a sort of a frequency of a, a, a period of about, uh, say, two or three seconds here. So the contraction every two or three seconds. And so what we did was we took all three of these adjuvant types and applied them in an experiment in which we're measuring the contraction frequency of these vessels. And it turns out all three types of adjuvants slow down lymphatic pumping. So they tell the vessel, vessel to relax. So you can see the diastolic diameter increases. Um, with, with all of these types of adjuvants and the contraction frequency goes down with all of these types of adjuvants. So it seems that adjuvants are slowing down the delivery of the information into the lymph node. Um, so what's the benefit of that? I, it's, and I'll, I'll come back to that later. Is it, this, this actually confused us to begin with, but we think we, we have a bet, maybe a better handle on this now. Now, the other thing that um, you'll know about uh, lymph nodes is that they swell when you get ill. And uh, that happens also with vaccine adjuvants. So here we've applied, uh, and this is in mice, we've applied vaccine adjuvants into the, into the foot pad of the mouse and looked at what happens in the nearest lymph node. So, uh, so these are uh, uh, just regular lymph nodes. And then this is uh, with, with fluid injection. And then this is after injection of the, the TLR activator adjuvant, but all the other act, uh, adjuvants do the same thing. And you can see that the weight of the lymph node has gone up within 24 hours and it stays that way after 72 hours. Volume, same deal. They're, they're really, they're, they're getting much bigger. Lymph nodes can get, uh, it can increase in volume by an order of magnitude, uh, depending on the type of attack that you're enduring. So. Uh, lymph node swelling is, is really something important to look out for. It happens with cancer as well. So uh, we wanted to understand then how this is affecting flow through the lymph node. Uh, and I'll remind you, a mouse lymph node, it's only about one millimeter in diameter. So uh, you, you can't really measure the flow in these things. But what you can do is uh, in that uh, foot pad injection experiment that I mentioned in the last slide, you can take the lymph node out uh, after sometime after the vaccination and see uh, and measure its overall flow resistance. resistance. Now, it's not an easy experiment. These, uh, these afferent and efferent vessels are about 50 to 70 microns in diameter, which is slightly smaller than a human hair in diameter. And uh, but we can cannulate them and we can measure the flow across them, which I'll remind you is in the order of uh, microliters per hour. And uh, the pressure differences across the lymph node are maybe a couple of centimeters of water. So it's, a, it's a, actually an exquisite little experiment to do. Um, so we get that flow resistance uh, and measurement, and we look at how it varies over time after the injection of the vaccine adjuvant. So this is the flow resistance across the vessel, across the lymph node. Um, 
in, in the healthy state, within 24 hours after the injection of the vaccine adjuvant, um, you can see that the, uh, the flow resistance of that lymph node goes up by several fold. And, uh, and, 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 and then within 72 hours has gone back to baseline level. Now in the last slide, what I showed you is that at 72 hours, these lymph nodes are still swollen. They're still very large. So the flow resistance is changing over a very different time scale than the size of the lymph node. So it's not tied really to the lymph node. And, and if anything, you would expect a large lymph node to be less resistive to flow than a small lymph node. So there's obviously some, some active control of lymph node flow resistance here. So then we thought, well, which part of the node is causing this increase in resistance here? Um, and, and again, with a one millimeter diameter lymph node, you can't really dig in and, and figure out what's going on inside. So we went back to the computational model and started changing different aspects here. So the, the things that might influence the flow path from the inlet to the outlet are the, the geometry of the subcouts or sinus, uh, the hydraulic conductivity of this tightly packed porous medium region here, or the hydraulic conductivity of this medullary sinus, which is sort of the collection point where fluid flow um, goes, uh, eventually goes out the exiting vessel. So we changed the uh, hydraulic conductivity of the T-cell cortex, this large region in the middle here, but uh, that didn't really change anything at all in terms of overall flow resistance, because remember under normal conditions, about 90% of the flow is going around the periphery and only about 10% of the flow is coming here. So you can change that all you want, it doesn't do anything. Um, the overall, uh, and then th we changed the height of the subcatheter sinus. It's normally about 20 microns in height. We changed it to 10, uh, didn't make any difference, barely perceptible difference on the plot of our experimental outcomes here in terms of overall flow resistance of that lymph node. Next, we change the hydraulic conductivity of this medullary sinus here, which again is the outflow collection port. And, uh, and that is actually the only part of the lymph node that we could change that would have any kind of significant effect of, on the overall flow resistance of the lymph node. And so what we think is happening is there are some specialized cells either in the medullary sinus or in the connecting, connecting point to the subcapsular sinus here that are throttling down that path of least resistance and then shunting more of the flow into the T cell cortex where your immune cells are. And indeed, when we modeled that shift in flow due to the uh, decreased hydro hydraulic conductivity of the medullary sinus, we found about a threefold increase in flow towards the middle of the T cell cortex. So essentially, you, you know, you've got this low resistance pathway around the outside under normal conditions, about 90% of the flow goes that way. But once some antigen is detected, that low resistance pathway gets shut down and more of the flow gets sent into the middle. Uh, and then you know, that mod it gets modulated back down with this, within 72 hours when you are still reacting and your T cells and B cells are still learning about the infection. So uh, this is really kind of all, all the world knows about the, the shifting of flow within the lymph node. Not many people have looked at this. and. Um, Hopefully some of you will get interested in and, and, and help us figure out what's going on inside lymph nodes. So, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this cartoon of the vaccination process and tell you a bit about what our current thinking is in terms of how we ought to be thinking about vaccine adjuvant design. I think it should start with the lymph node. The lymph node is where the immune cells exist in the highest density and where your adaptive immunity is really going to happen. So we ought to start by asking the lymph node, all right, what is the time, ideal time course of information delivery that you need in order to maximize that, the communication of that information down to the T cells and the B cells and the other immune cells located within the lymph node so that that adaptive immunity process is really optimized. And uh, I, I, it's a fascinating question. We, we've only got a, a part of the answer to that question. And if the funding gods smile upon us, in, uh, hopefully we'll know more about this in the next five years. Um, and I think the next thing to do after that is then, all right, once you know what the lymph node needs to optimize adaptive immunity, immunity in terms of a time course of delivery of that information, 
is to then require that of, of, of the actively pumping lymphatic vessels that are delivering that information to the lymph node. And what we've seen so far is that adjuvants slow down the active pumping characteristics of these vessels. So it could be that a long, slow delivery, gradual delivery of that antigen information into the lymph node is what's needed in order to maximize adaptive immunity or at least make it better. So, and I'll remind you that the, the, the vaccine itself is injected intramuscularly. So it's, it's going into a place where there are very few lymphatic vessels. Those adjuvants are slowing down the pumping. It really suggests that the lymph node needs a gradual delivery of that immune information, which uh, is, is sort of counterintuitive, but um, again, a, a, not enough people have worked on this to, to really tease out what's important to the lymph node in this process. And then finally, let's go back to the interstitium because I'll, I'll tell you that the, the delivery of the information from the syringe into these initial lymphatics is quite an interesting process in itself. And it depends on the molecular weight of the material being injected. It depends on the local state of inflammation. It depends on uh, a lot of things that, um, you know, the charge and how it binds to the extracellular matrix in the interstitial spaces. Uh, lots of things that have not really been thoroughly investigated yet. So I think there's lots of interesting research to be done at all three levels here in terms of trying to optimize delivery of information into the lymph node. So uh, wrapping up, hopefully I've convinced you that um, despite the fact that these are low pressure, low flow and low peccoli number phenomena, this is still an important and interesting system to look at. Um, there's an uh, anisotropic delivery of small antigens within lymph nodes uh, due to the uh, conduit structures with those collagen conduits, uh, uh, fibers within them. Uh, and then with vaccines and, and cancer, everything changes inside the lymph node. And we don't really know much about how, uh, how those changes affect the flow of lymph or the flow of blood through the lymph node. We know lymph nodes swell. What's the benefit of that? Uh, we, we've got some ideas about that, which I haven't talked about today. But everything changes inside the lymph node when you have either a, a vaccination or an immune response or, or, or a spread of cancer cells through your lymph node. And that I think is uh, a, a, a hugely important phenomenon that, that, that you know, these are incredibly important things that we need to know more about. So with vaccines, you know, what does lymph node need and how do we deliver it? I think it's the way we should start thinking about it adjuvants and then and how do adjuvants work what can we do to improve them and how do we provide a guideline to vaccine developers to tell them okay with that particular antigen you need to use th this particular adjuvant and again it's it's all just empirically done now and you can do better than that i think our evidence suggests you know these dynamic fluid shifts the, the flow resistance goes with up in 24 hours goes back down after 72 uh, and, and the lymph node is still swollen in. So they're very interesting uh, fluid shifts and cell population changes and over differing time scales, and, and we need to know more about that. Um, and with that, I'll close up. Uh, if you don't get a chance to answer, uh, ask a question today, I'll, I'm happy to be contacted by email. You can see our lab website uh, down in the right-hand corner. So with that, I'll close with acknowledgments to all the people that really helped out uh, that really did the research here. I mentioned earlier that we can cannulate lymphatic vessels down to 50 microns in diameter. My hands shake too much to be able to do that. And, and I don't do those experiments, but these people do. And they're all wonderful. And, and I appreciate all their efforts. So with that, I'll, I'll close up and I'm happy to answer any questions now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Very, very interesting. Um, and I'm sure everyone was very keen to find out more about lymph nodes. And next time you have a throat infection, you know, you will know that lymph node swells because of the permeability of the medulla. There you go. So, so Yazdan, uh, would you like to ask your question? And Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, first, thank you very much for your fantastic presentation. Second, I have a question regarding the porous media. Would you please mention what modeling you have done on porous media, how you characterize the porous media there? Uh, in, in just very simple ways, and, th and thanks for the question. So um, it, it, in, in the initial CFD model of the lymph node that I showed you earlier, it's uh, just Darcy Brinkman, basically. 
Um, so it's it's very much a black box approach. We've not gotten down to the point of uh, modeling the force medium at the scale of, of the cell or, or that subcellular level, uh, not yet. And um, I think that would be really important to do because obviously it's an you know, inhomogeneous anisotropic structure and, uh, and we've just not gotten to that point yet in our model. Okay, thank you. And um, by the way, uh, can I send you an email? You will Absolutely, respond? please do, please do. And uh, we'd love any input on this. Uh, you know, there, uh, one thing I, I didn't point out, but uh, there, there are only about 10 bioengineering groups around the world studying the lymphatic system. I wish there were more. I, I you know, I, I don't want to keep this territory to myself. I'm not a, a jealous type and I'm not uh, protective of this at all. We, I, I really think we need more people working on these hugely important um, systems. So, um, so uh, any questions at all or any suggestions, I'd be glad to hear them. Tim? Well, I have a question, Jimmy. Uh, first, Hi, of all, first of all, um, yeah, it's nice to see you and thanks for a, an interesting talk. I realized as you were talking how little I know about lymph nodes. For example, <clears throat> does do the um, arrangement and uh, number uh, and positions of lymph nodes, are they the same in everybody, like blood vessels more or less are, or is there a significant probability distribution that's different from one person to another? And if so, does that give an opportunity for, um, for manipulating the delivery of vaccines or other uh, chemicals uh, for medical clinical purposes? Excellent question. I, I, yeah, as expected from Tim Pedley, great question. So thank you. Uh, so um, there is a lot of individual variability in the lymphatic system, just in the vessel layout. So if you think about, uh, you know, everybody's got an aorta and it's roughly the same shape, right? Uh, but, um, and it, the largest lymphatic vessel, yeah, it, it runs up the middle of the thorax in, in pretty much everyone. But the important part of the lymphatic system is actually in a smaller vessel. So if you think about um, individual variability in the lymphatic system, it's probably about the same as the individual variability of arterioles and capillaries and venules in amongst people, right? So, so there's, there's, there, there is a lot of variability, we know that. Uh, in terms of lymph node location, well, you have about five or 600 lymph nodes in the body total. Um, they tend to gather in certain places. So um, you have a lot in kind of the groin area. You have uh, 30 or 40 lymph nodes in the axillary region under the arm. You have several around the, the, the neck. Um, and uh, so about five or, and, and a bunch in the, in the gut as well. And, and if you think about it, if, if this is your body's defense system, the immune system, right? So you want to put your defenses where you're most likely to be attacked. So, uh, so that's in the gut, and uh, and then there are a lot of lymphatic vessels. Skin is the other place you're you're likely to be attacked, and um, they're, they exist in the lungs in, in big numbers as well. <coughs> so yeah, there there is a lot of variability once you start looking within those locations, say within the the axilla, the axilla here, the uh, the location exact locations of those thirty or forty lymph nodes uh, is going to vary quite a bit. Um, and there's actually a lot of individual variability in terms of how actively lymphatic vessels pump. Um, and, and in the legs, there's only one lymph node, it's behind your knee. Uh, so, so if you get an infection in your toe, uh, you, you want that information transported pretty quickly to that lymph node behind your knee. And similarly, the density of active bits uh, within a lymph node would vary between from person to person, quite apart from their state of uh, infection or whatever it may be. Presumably, yes. I I don't know that there's a lot of information out there on that. That would, that would be interesting to look at. Okay. So it looks like from the data that the normal period of lymphatic pump is about six seconds. Um, so yeah, it's about two or three seconds, uh, and so. You, imagine the system being sort of these lymphatic vessels that are contracting, then there's a valve, then there's another lymphatic vessel, um, a, another lymphangion, as we call them. So lymphangion means the vessel segment between two valves. So you've got one that's contracting here, 
another one that's contracting at maybe in phase, maybe completely out of phase, and maybe this vessel is completely relaxed and this one is doing all the work. And we see all of those happening in the body. So it's not a regular uh, contraction. When they are contracting, it's a period of about two or three seconds. Um, now there's also, uh, there's also, that's, that's the intrinsic pumping that happens due to the contraction of the muscle cells that are buried uh, in the lymphatic vessel wall. But you can also, if you just compress the tissue from the outside, you can get those vessels to contract. So you actually get some pre-lymphatic pumping, similar to muscle pumping in the legs that is important for venous return. So if you're on a long uh, flight um, and they tell you to move your legs around to keep venous uh, blood moving. It's also keeping your lymph moving as well. So definitely get up and move around. Um, so there's, uh, yeah, so there is a prominent component of blood pressure power spectrum just about that frequency. So in cases where lymphatic vessels are running alongside arteries, they do benefit from the pulsation of the arteries. And um, so whether or not there's synchronization there, uh, I, I'm not sure about that, but at least there's a similarity in sort of, you know, the order of magnitude of the, the pumping of phenomena happening on the order of about one hertz and, and slightly smaller frequency for lymphatic vessels. But thanks for the question. Well, you know, uh, my interest is in microgravity studies. And uh, for example, mm. is there some relationship with the gravitational force in this study. For example, if we go to microgravity, then there is no or very small g-force. Do you think, or g-acceleration, do you think it will change the study? Given the fact that you mentioned that uh, when somebody does not move at all, it will be very, very problematic. Absolutely, it's a, it's a hugely important problem and, and thanks for bringing it up. So. Uh, we know that when astronauts spend a lot of time in microgravity, that their immune system, uh, that, that they have a lot of immune system dysfunction. We think that has to do with the, the effects of gravity on uh, the effects of, or the absence of gravity, you might say, on, on lymphatics. So uh, one of my collaborators, Dave Zaveo, who's at Texas A&M, has actually done some experiments on uh, looking at the contractility of lymphatic vessels in mice that have been subjected to microgravity. So they got flown up to the uh, space station and back, and then um, they collected the mice and, and looked at their um, lymph nodes and looked at their lymphatic vessels. And I think that work is still ongoing and, and hopefully going to be published soon. Um, on the modeling side, there are uh, James Baish at uh, a, a up in uh, the Boston area, along with Lance Munn, uh, have looked have recently been looking at the effects of microgravity on uh, on lymphatic pumping, and it certainly does have an effect. Um, your uh, yeah, they, they, there's a lot of variability around the body in terms of how actively these lymphatic muscles contract, and the ones that need to fight gravity. Um, they tend to get either a lot of help in the case of the legs from the, the surrounding tissue movements when you're when you're walking so and, and so forth um, compared to those that are you know in the neck where they do benefit from gravity to return the lymph down to the shoulders um, and so yeah there 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 is a lot of variability in that and gravity is hugely important and we think it's uh, going to be very important for long term space flight. Can I ask a question about the, the imaging technique that was used to get the black and white movie of the lymph flow in the rat? How sure. it seems amazing to get that sort of movie. How was it done? So you're talking about the contracting, the pumping, the, that movie? Um, yeah. yeah, I think, I think that's the yeah. one. It's yeah, yeah. So, so, so the uh, the mesentery is it's chock full of lymphatics. So basically, that's a we we cut the model, cut the rat open. We bring <clears> the mesentery <throat> out of the body over on to onto a microscope stage, essentially, and then you just hunt around. It won't, doesn't take very long to find a lymphatic vessel. You just get it in focus, um, and then you can you can see those cells going through there. So, there, there lymphatic vessels are are very thin walled. So that vessel was about 100 microns in diameter. 
its wall thickness was about 20 or 30 microns maybe. Uh, so you could just see right through them and, uh, and you can see the cells within. And, um, and, but the, the, the key is you have to um, have a very high speed camera attached to your microscope. So we shoot that at about two or 300 frames per second um, because with a microscope, you're amplifying uh, space, but not time. And while those cells are moving at a fairly low velocity, with a you know with a 500 micron field of view, they zoom right past if you don't have a high speed camera on. Mm. And so, is is the rat still alive when that's happening, or is it? Yeah, yeah, it's it's anesthetized, so it's it's uh, and an uh, anesthesia does affect your lymphatic function. So we have to be careful what anesthesia we give them, but. Um, yeah, they, if they're anesthetized and the animal's still alive. Okay. And they're killed right after the end of the experiment. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I have a question actually, and then maybe we can okay. wrap up. Um, so my question is more like practical one. Um, so like considering the current interest in vaccine developing, and I mean, it's always been an interest, but now in particular, yeah. Do you have any like big pharma companies sort of approaching you and you know asking and you know, maybe like suggesting to fund or collaborate or something? This must be like a good opportunity. No, they, they no, they're they're not being down the door of the lab trying to to uh, bring in loads of cash. So we we okay. we'd like to get them interested in the vaccine adjuvant story. Um, it's uh, it, it's a bit of an uphill battle because if you just look at the history of lymphatic research and immune system research, it's been mainly at the biological level. And of course, we know a lot about um, the, the biology of, of inflammation and immune reaction and and all of that. But, um, you know, we're, so we're, we are bringing kind of a strange point of view talking about fluid mechanics. And if you talk to these people, don't put equations up um, in front of them and um, so it, it takes, it's going to take a little while, I think, to convince them of the importance of, um, of you know, fluid mechanics and, and information as an information delivery process in, in the system. But, you know, we're, we're, we're hoping if we can get some grant funding, at least, to do more of this work on the vaccine adjuvants, then uh, we'll get their attention. And, uh, you know, we essentially, we'd like to help them. So they, they should... Uh, um, yeah, no, they should be welcoming yeah. of this message. We were trying to help them develop better vaccines. And, and of course, that's going to benefit everyone around the world. 